Thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing, question everything, and start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast, hosted by Seth Andrews. I am quite sure that at this moment there are apologists and evangelicals and even armchair Christians who are kind of smirking. The atheists lost one of their own. Ayan Hirsi Ali, for so long, a public, front-line, proud atheist, has just said she is a Christian. And if you're not familiar with her, I am going to give you some background quickly before I speak to Jonathan M. S. Pierce. He's a columnist and philosopher and a friend who has written publicly about all of this. And I thought he would be great to weigh in for the final part of the broadcast. So let's set up all of this with a little bit of backstory. Ayan Hirsi Ali, she was born in Mogadishu back in 1969. Her dad was a political activist. He was part of the Somali revolution that was protesting communist government. For that, they put him in prison. He escaped, and the family escaped Somalia in 1977. Ayan was only eight years old at the time. The family then settled in Kenya, had a pretty good life. Ayan went to a Muslim school which was increasingly influenced by Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia has a pretty strict Wahhabist version of Islam, and that's what they were teaching more and more in Ayan school. And she was a Muslim, a devout Muslim, a true believer. She prayed and read the Quran and wore the hijab and everything. So we skip forward from her schooling to her adulthood. This is 1992. Ayan claims she was arranged to be married against her will. She wanted nothing to do with this, but she was worried about the consequences. She specifically worried about an honor killing. She would be executed for disobeying her family, her culture, and Allah. And so she begged for political asylum in the Netherlands, which they did Grant. Now, her family came forward and said, this is all a bunch of crap. She was never in danger. She lived a great life, kept in touch with her family even after she had moved to the Netherlands. And she herself had to admit years later that she had made up a bunch of information she gave to the Dutch government. She lied about her name. She lied about her birth date and some of the circumstances. But Ayan Hirsi Ali insists that there was an arranged marriage and she was trying to escape it. Ayan, very intelligent and well-educated. She speaks six languages, got a degree in political science back in 2001. And then 9-11 happened and this rattled her Islamic cage. She said for really the first time it was 9-11 that caused her to see more clearly the Islamic language of jihad, the radicals justifying mass murder. And as a human being, she could not reconcile it. And so she began to reverse engineer and deconstruct Islam. She went back to the Quran for a more objective reading And by 2002, she had totally renounced her Muslim faith and said, I am an atheist. And then began her activism, mostly against Islam and its oppression of women. She dared to talk about those verses in the Quran where Muhammad married a six-year-old and raped her when she was nine. She rightly said Muhammad would be considered a pedophile by any standard today. 
and for saying that publicly she got death threats. One of her associates in activism was executed 2004. She was working with a film director, a guy named Theo Van Gogh. She helped to write and voice a documentary called Submission that talked about the horrible treatment of women under Islamic regimes. And that year, 2004, Theo Van Gogh was walking outside. A man came and shot and stabbed and nearly beheaded him. His dead body found in the street had a note pinned to it with a knife. That note was written to Ayan Hersi Ali. It was a death threat. She went into hiding. 2006. She moved to the United States. She got her green card in 2007, became a citizen in 2013. She founded the AHA Foundation. This is a nonprofit created to protect women and girls in the United States against Islamic oppression and other human rights abuses. And she remained a professing atheist. She wrote several books, including 2006, she wrote Infidel Nomad, published in 2010. Three years ago, she released Pray, Immigration, Islam, and the Erosion of Women's Rights. She has written for The Daily Beast, The New York Post, The Spectator, and other publications. Ayan Hirsi Ali has been fiercely critical of the West for trying to distance Islam from radical Islam. She says there's really no difference. They're all part of this same machine. That has softened a little bit. She used to say you can't reform Islam. But these days, reform seems to be more of that conversation. Let's moderate the religion where we can. Politically, this woman has been a mess. Ayan Hirsi Ali supported Trump. She declared that he did, in fact, have the legal right to implement his Muslim ban for the entire country. She wanted extreme vetting, her words, extreme vetting of Muslim migrants and the targeting of a single religion in this country for investigation. She dismissed the Women's March on Washington back in 2017 and called American feminists idiotic women consumed with the trivial. She gave a speech called Wokeism and How to Counter It. She calls woke an ideological stew of identity politics, groupthink, social justice, critical race theory, and the practice of canceling anyone who fails to toe the woke line. She supported Brett Kavanaugh for Supreme Court, She has often come after the left, those wokists, for being enemies of free speech. She has compared the woke to Islamist. She said wokeness is the return of white supremacy. None other than Christian propaganda mill Prager U called Ayan Hirsi Ali a champion of free speech and enemy of wokeness. Now, many of us on the left have said that she has made some very problematic and overly simplistic statements, and she doesn't like to be criticized for it. So, she is claiming that we are just intolerant. We are the intolerant, anti-free speech woke. And if I can speak for myself, I used to be a big fan of Ayan Hirsi Ali. I read Infidel and loved it. I really appreciated her fierce criticisms of Islam, even at the risk of her own life. But in recent years, she's become so frustrating because she seems to want to reduce complex human rights issues down to bumper stickers. I mean, the Women's March? She saw it as the acting out of entitled women who just don't want to do the dishes. Or they want to fight with their husbands about who does the dishes. That was what she said. But I saw the march as a public statement of protest and empowerment. Trump had just been inaugurated. 
He had proudly talked about grabbing a woman by the pussy. He was a sexist pig. He was declaring war on reproductive rights and aligning himself with bigoted evangelical Christian nationalists. And these millions of women had been marching nationwide, not just on Washington, but they'd been marching in solidarity with women, with protections for all human rights. Why in the world would Diane Hersey Ali called these protesters spoiled brats just squabbling over the unimportant. And that kind of thing really started to distance me from her. She's trying to meme complex human rights conversations, and the world just doesn't work that way. Then, this month, November 13th, 2023, Diane Hersey Ali publishes this article titled, Why I Am Now a Christian. And the piece is just jaw-droppingly bad, poorly reasoned, pathetically defended, and of course, the Christian world is gobbling this thing up like it's candy. Now, I don't know what else to do before I talk to Jonathan Pierce. I don't know what else to do but to read her article in its entirety, so we can talk about it. Now, I am estimating this to be between a 15 and 18 minute read, and I don't want to interrupt it. So let me take a short break here, and I will come back and read for you Ian Hersey Ali's reasons why she is no longer an atheist and she is now a Christian, and we're going to comment on that next. Ayan Hersey Ali in the headlines all around the world this past week. A former frontline atheist activist who now says she has become a Christian. She is a former Muslim, now a former atheist, found her some Jesus. But why? Why would this happen? Well, she has, I'm going to call them reasons. I'm going to call them reasons. They're bad reasons. And I want to read for you her reasons by reading the article she posted. I'll be back with philosopher columnist Jonathan M.S. Pierce to discuss after I read this statement. Ayan Hersey Ali has published on unheard, U-N-H-E-R-D dot com, why I am now a Christian, atheism can't equip us for civilizational war. In 2002, I discovered a 1927 lecture by Bertrand Russell entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian. It did not cross my mind as I read it that one day, nearly a century after he delivered it to the South London branch of the National Secular Society, I would be compelled to write an essay with precisely the opposite title. The year before, I had publicly condemned the terrorist attacks of the 19 men who had hijacked passenger jets and crashed them into the Twin Towers in New York. They had done it in the name of my religion, Islam. I was a Muslim then, although not a practicing one. If I truly condemned their actions, then where did that leave me? The underlying principle that justified the attacks was religious, after all, the idea of jihad or holy war against the infidels. Was it possible for me, as for many members of the Muslim community, simply to distance myself from the action and its horrific results? At the time, there were many eminent leaders in the West, politicians, scholars, journalists, and other experts, who insisted that the terrorists were motivated by reasons other than the ones they and their leader, Osama bin Laden, had articulated so clearly. So Islam had an alibi. This excuse-making was not only condescending towards Muslims, it also gave many Westerners a chance to retreat into denial. Blaming the errors of U.S. foreign policy was easier than contemplating the possibility that we were confronted with a religious war. We've seen a similar tendency in the past five weeks as millions of people sympathetic to the plight of Gazans seek to rationalize the October 7th terrorist attacks 
as a justified response to the policies of the Israeli government. When I read Russell's lecture, I found my cognitive dissonance easing. It was a relief to adopt an attitude of skepticism toward religious doctrine, discard my faith in God, and declare that no such entity existed. Best of all, I could reject the existence of hell and the danger of everlasting punishment. Russell's assertion that religion is based primarily on fear resonated with me. I had lived for too long in terror of all the gruesome punishments that awaited me. While I had abandoned all the rational reasons for believing in God, that irrational fear of hellfire still lingered. Russell's conclusion thus came as something of a relief. When I die, I shall rot. To understand why I became an atheist 20 years ago, you first need to understand the kind of Muslim I had been. I was a teenager when the Muslim Brotherhood penetrated my community in Nairobi, Kenya, in 1985. I don't think I had even understood religious practice before the coming of the Brotherhood. I had endured the rituals of ablutions, prayers, and fasting as tedious and pointless. The preachers of the Muslim Brotherhood changed this. They articulated a direction, the straight path, a purpose to work towards admission into Allah's paradise after death, a method, the Prophet's instruction manual of do's and don'ts, the halal and the haram, As a detailed supplement to the Quran, the Hadith spelled out how to put into practice the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, God and the devil. The Brotherhood preachers left nothing to the imagination. They gave us a choice. Strive to live by the Prophet's manual and reap the glorious rewards in the hereafter— On this earth, meanwhile, the greatest achievement possible was to die as a martyr for the sake of Allah. The alternative, indulging in the pleasures of the world, was to earn Allah's wrath and be condemned to an eternal life in hell fire. Some of the worldly pleasures they were decrying, including reading novels, listening to music, dancing, and going to the cinema— all of which I was ashamed to admit that I adored. The most striking quality of the Muslim Brotherhood was their ability to transform me and my fellow teenagers from passive believers into activists almost overnight. We didn't just say things or pray for things, we did things. As girls, we donned the burqa and swore off Western fashion and makeup. The boys cultivated their facial hair to the greatest extent possible. They wore the white dress-like taub worn in Arab countries or had their trousers shortened above their ankle bones. We operated in groups and volunteered our services in charity to the poor, the old, the disabled, and the weak. We urged fellow Muslims to pray and demanded that non-Muslims convert to Islam. During Islamic study sessions, we shared with the preacher in charge of the session our worries. For instance, what should we do about the friends we loved and felt loyal to, but who refused to accept our dawah, our invitation to the faith? In response, we were reminded repeatedly about the clarity of the Prophet's instructions. We were told in no uncertain terms that we could not be loyal to Allah and Muhammad, while also maintaining friendships and loyalty toward the unbelievers. If they explicitly rejected our summons to Islam, we were to hate and curse them. Here, a special hatred was reserved for one subset of unbeliever, the Jew. We cursed the Jews multiple times a day, and expressed horror, disgust, and anger at the litany of offenses he had allegedly committed. The Jew had betrayed our prophet. He had occupied the holy mosque in Jerusalem. He continued to spread corruption of the heart, mind, and soul. You can see why, to someone who had been through such a religious schooling, 
atheism seemed so appealing. Bertrand Russell offered a simple, zero-cost escape from an unbearable life of self-denial and harassment of other people. For him, there was no credible case for the existence of God. Religion, Russell argued, was rooted in fear. He said, fear is the basis of the whole thing. Fear of the mysterious, fear of defeat, fear of death. As an atheist, I thought I would lose that fear. I also found an entirely new circle of friends as different from the preachers of the Muslim Brotherhood as one could imagine. The more time I spent with them, people such as Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins, the more confident I felt that I had made the right choice. For the atheists were clever. They were also a great deal of fun. So, what changed? Why do I call myself a Christian now? Part of the answer is global. Western civilization is under threat from three different but related forces. The resurgence of great power authoritarianism and expansionism in the forms of the Chinese Communist Party and Vladimir Putin's Russia. The rise of global Islamism, which threatens to mobilize a vast population against the West. And the viral spread of woke ideology which is eating into the moral fiber of the next generation. We endeavor to fend off these threats with modern secular tools, military, economic, diplomatic, and technological efforts to defeat, bribe, persuade, appease, or surveil. And yet, with every round of conflict, we find ourselves losing ground. We're either running out of money with our national debt in the tens of trillions of dollars, or we are losing our lead in the technological race with China. But we can't fight off these formidable forces unless we can answer the question, what is it that unites us? The response that God is dead seems insufficient. So, too, does the attempt to find solace in the rules-based liberal international order. The only credible answer, I believe, lies in our desire to uphold the legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition. That legacy consists of an elaborate set of ideas and institutions designed to safeguard human life, freedom, and dignity— From the nation-state and the rule of law to the institutions of science, health, and learning. As Tom Holland has shown in his marvelous book, Dominion, all sorts of apparently secular freedoms of the market, of conscience, and of the press find their roots in Christianity. And so I have come to realize that Russell and my atheist friends failed to see the wood for the trees. The wood is the civilization built on the Judeo-Christian tradition. It is the story of the West, warts and all. Russell's critique of those contradictions in Christian doctrine is serious, but it is also too narrow in scope. For instance, he gave his lecture in a room full of former or at least doubting Christians in a Christian country. Think about how unique that was nearly a century ago and how rare it still is in non-Western civilizations. Could a Muslim philosopher stand before any audience in a Muslim country then or now and deliver a lecture with the title, Why I Am Not a Muslim? In fact, a book with that title exists, written by an ex-Muslim. But the author published it in America under the pseudonym Ibn Warwick. It would have been too dangerous to do otherwise. To me, this freedom of conscience and speech is perhaps the greatest benefit of Western civilization. It does not come naturally to man. It is the product of centuries of debate within Jewish and Christian communities. It was these debates that advanced science and reason, diminished cruelty, suppressed superstitions, and built institutions to order and protect life, while guaranteeing freedom to as many people 
as possible. Unlike Islam, Christianity outgrew its dogmatic stage. I'm sorry, I'm about to choke. I'm trying to choke this back. <laughs> Christianity outgrew its dogmatic stage. It became increasingly clear that Christ's teaching implied not only a circumscribed role for religion, as something separate from politics, it also implied compassion for the sinner and humility for the believer. Yet, I would not be truthful if I attributed my embrace of Christianity solely to the realization that atheism is too weak and divisive a doctrine to fortify us against our menacing foes. I have also turned to Christianity because I ultimately found life without any spiritual solace unendurable, indeed very nearly self-destructive. Atheism failed to answer a simple question, what is the meaning and purpose of life? Russell and other atheist activists believe that with the rejection of God, we would enter an age of reason and intelligent humanism. But the God hole, the void left by the retreat of the church, has merely been filled by a jumble of irrational quasi-religious dogma. The result is a world where modern cults prey on the dislocated masses, offering them spurious reasons for being and action, mostly by engaging in virtue-signaling theater on behalf of a victimized minority or our supposedly doomed planet. The line often attributed to G.K. Chesterton has turned into a prophecy, quote, When men choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. In this nihilistic vacuum, the challenge before us becomes civilizational. We can't withstand China, Russia, and Iran if we can't explain to our populations why it matters that we do. We can't fight woke ideology if we can't defend the civilization that it is determined to destroy. And we can't counter Islamism with purely secular tools— To win the hearts and minds of Muslims here in the West, we have to offer them something more than videos on TikTok. The lesson I learned from my years with the Muslim Brotherhood was the power of a unifying story embedded in the foundational texts of Islam to attract, engage, and mobilize the Muslim masses. Unless we offer something as meaningful I fear the erosion of our civilization will continue, and fortunately, there is no need to look for some New Age concoction of medication and mindfulness. Christianity has it all. That is why I no longer consider myself a Muslim apostate, but a lapsed atheist. Of course, I still have a great deal to learn about Christianity, I discover a little more at church each Sunday. But I have recognized in my own long journey through a wilderness of fear and self-doubt that there is a better way to manage the challenges of existence than either Islam or unbelief had to offer. And I have to remark quickly about that line in the last paragraph, certainly, where she says, I have a lot to learn about Christianity, meaning I don't know very much about it, but somehow she knows it's true. In just a second, I want to speak to a gentleman who wrote a column commenting on her column. He's a fellow activist, humanist, philosopher. His name is Jonathan M. S. Pierce. He's going to give us his take next. I wanted to talk about all of this with a friend, a philosopher, author, columnist, and I guess some people would consider pain in the ass because he's always stirring the pot out there. (laughs) Jonathan M. S. Pierce. Hey, brother. Good to have you. Hey, thanks for contacting me, Seth. Uh, Always good to talk about uh, these sorts of things. And this one sort of came out of the blue, I guess. I just finished giving a profile of Ayan Hirsi Ali and her background, and I used to be a big fan. You know, I loved Infidel when I read it and appreciated her fierce stand against Islam. 
And I aligned with her a little bit in that I don't think you can fully separate Muslims from Islam. I myself have become frustrated that this sort of silent culture of people who hold to the Quran have not been more vocal in the wake of Islamic terrorism, blah, blah, blah. But I've also come to realize that just like Christians, many, many, I think even most Muslims have sort of fashioned a faith in their own image. They're lovely people mm. who may have some bad ideas, but it's unfair to align them with the jihadists, you know. And Does any of that resonate with you, man? Hugely. Like, this, oh my goodness, I could digress for a very long time here. So I have actually presented before on Islam being an inherently theologically violent religion and one, as you say, must differentiate between Islam and Muslims here. But when you look at the text of the Quran, and when you look at the Hadith particularly, these are texts that do not sit very well with someone who's a secular humanist. In fact, I read the Quran and felt somewhat dehumanized. Now, I've written on this before and presented on this, and I've been, it's probably been the most pushback I've ever had with anything I've said from fellow liberals. Now, I'm a lefty liberal. But I, I will not shy away from saying what I think are the truths here. Now, let me guess. You were called an Islamophobe. Well, not quite, but it, you, okay. you could see it going on the way to that. Like fellow people, but because you're, you're picking on a group of people that some assume are some kind of oppressed minority, because they're a minority in certain sections of certain societies around the world, they're therefore kind of ring-fenced from criticism. But of course, you know, that, that's irrelevant to the truth of what I'm saying. Now, I then came to a realization that what I was saying, however true it might be, might not aid social cohesion. So I started stepping back from saying that, not because I didn't find what I was saying had value in terms of its truth, but because it could be divisive and could be used by people who were genuinely Islamophobic to try and sow division and discord and you know, have a go at Muslims on account of them being Muslims, not on account of like theological wranglings over whether these texts are inherently violent or not. So if you walk into the room, you don't lead with Muhammad was a pedophile. You don't lead <laughs> with that, even though it's there, right? Even though we, it's you and I, we have to have the hard discussions about those types of things. And if I say that, there are some, even some liberals, my fellow lefties who say Seth is an Islamophobe. And I always try to differentiate between Islam, which is a truth claim, an ideology, a dogma, and Muslims. I think there's a difference between anti-Muslim bigotry and Islamophobia. I myself struggle. I think Islamophobia is a bullshit term. I don't know. Would you agree, disagree with that? Well, yeah, so it's an interesting. I once called myself rationally Islamophobic, which was like, <laughs> which is an oxymoron because it's an irrational fear. But, but it's the idea that you know, I look at Muslims and I say, right, if you, my thesis is, if you are a, like, scare quotes, true Muslim, and we can talk about the provenance of Islam or the, the holy text compared to the provenance of the Bible, and there's a real difference because if this is a direct word of God, as dictated through the archangel, you know, Gabriel or whatever, then it is, I guess, easier to get a true Islam than it is to get a true Christianity, if you like, which is why I think there's such a vast array of Christianities around the world, because you, it's the word of, is the inspired word of God, not the direct word of God. And you can interpret it how you like and so on and so forth. Whereas with the Quran, it's literally the word of God and it's supposed to be in Arabic, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can get this idea, I think, that we can approximate more easily a truer version of Islam. Now, what that then means is that you can go up to Muslims who are kind of peace-loving, liberal Muslims like myself, morally like myself, and say, actually, you're wrong about your faith. You should be more violent. And of course, that's not what you want to do. So it's this weird paradigm where the Muslims I associate better with are the ones I think have a, a less correct version of their faith. Do you see what I mean? Well, I think ultimately the umbrella point would be it's not enough to be correct if we want to be effective. I used to be the guy coming out of the faith where I would walk into the room with a big T-shirt and placards and I'd be pounding my gavel and I was just a, mm. a freight train. And I came to the conclusion that I did more damage than good if I was yeah. trying to engage in conversation, you know, create discourse, change minds, even my own, that kind of thing. We're setting all this up because we're talking about Ayan Hirsi Ali. Yeah. Your article on her caught my attention. Now, I have read 
her statement for the audience. So let's get into your analysis. What do you think? Well, first of all, she wrote it in a publication. It's called Unheard, which is a sort of center-right, right-leaning, often anti-woke, quasi-religious website, as in it does have connections to Christianity and so on and so forth. And that's interesting in, in and of itself, like the choice of where to say this. And then what she said in that article as to why she has embraced Christianity or why she labels herself as Christian now was kind of devoid of any decent rational analysis. Basically, it's not a positive, I guess, rational argument for Christianity based on evidence. It's much more about, like, I don't want to be dismissive here, but much more about the feels. It's like- No, to be dismissive, that's what I call it. Like, you didn't see her say, here are the proofs I have discovered for the existence of God. It was more about- you know, some people treated me shitty and I'm frustrated and I kind of miss the the warm fuzzies and that kind of, there was a lot of that in there. Would you agree? Absolutely. So a lot of it was to do with, I'm lacking a meaning and purpose in life. I'm missing something. And, there, and I think Christianity can give that to me rather than, you know, arguing from the basis, the rational basis of Christianity as evidentially justified as looking at the Bible and saying, well, this theologically makes sense. It's more like, oh, I'm just, I have this hole in my life that I think can only be filled by something like Christianity. And I I always think that that is just not interacting with something like a positive vision of secular humanism. But really get to grips with, you know, understanding meaning and purpose and understanding these big philosophical ideas and get into grips with them rather than going, oh, no, oh, I, I'm missing that. Therefore, jumping into Christianity was one of the things I took from it. I noticed that she had to step into Judeo-Christianity and how it has helped to build civilized society and it's provided all these things. And of course, you and I are like, have you opened a history book as to how Christianity was spread? I mean, yeah, you'll find examples of structure and civilization that have been heavily influenced, and you will find examples of destruction and oppression and, and you know, the slaughter of indigenous peoples and torture and rape and all those other things in the name of Christianity. I mean, it, she sounds like Mike Johnson, the new U.S. Oh, Speaker goodness. of the House, when she talks about Judeo-Christian civilization. And it's almost to f- forget what the Greeks and Romans did, you know, what the Romans ever done for us type thing. It's just, yeah, it it gets me. And it's very similar to that conversation you often hear from Christians who say, look at all the scientists throughout history and Christianity is responsible for science. No, humans were responsible for science. And it just so happens the default religion of those humans in most of these places was Christianity. And therefore you are, it's it's a correlation fallacy, isn't it? So the idea that Christianity is responsible for these things, as you rightfully point out, is a problem. But a lot of what she says was also, I think, I think politics was a vehicle by which she got into Christianity by just by reading what she was saying. A few things that caught my eye were quotes like this. Part of the answer is global. So the answer as to why she changed and became a Christian. Part of the answer is global. Western civilization is under threat from three different but related forces. The resurgence of great power authoritarianism and expansionism in the forms of the Chinese Communist Party and Vladimir Putin's Russia, the rise of global Islamism, which threatens to mobilize a vast population against the West, and a viral spread of woke ideology, which is eating into the moral fiber of the next generation. And as soon as someone places like anti-woke or wokeism at the center of their issues with the world, it like sets alarm bells going for me because I think it's such an ill-defined term and it tells me more about them and where they are than anything else. And it's like, ah, oh, the viral spread of woke ideology. So when you start looking into her positioning, it's very much a political thing as much as anything. And I think once you start getting down that rabbit hole of that way of thinking, it's possibly not too surprising that you can see someone jump from like an ardent atheism into Christianity, because it's almost like the horseshoe theory of politics, where you've got the extreme left and the extreme right actually quite close to each other. And you can see her sort of like that jumping from just one position to the other as a result of her political leanings. I don't know. That that was kind of what I got out of a lot of what she was saying. The word woke is such a freaking hot button. Yeah. And I will be the first to admit I have seen my fellow liberals who have just, you know, they've gone off the deep end. I get it. But I've also 
more than that, really seeing how the word woke has been weaponized by the right to attack basic human decency, empathy, equality. We watch Ron DeSantis down in Florida. We watch Ryan Walters in my home state. You know, we see the theocrats, the Christian nationalists, and woke seems to be their new buzzword. You ask them to define it, good luck with that. It just seems to be anything that grazes their delicate, privileged sensibilities. Talk about woke from your perspective, sir. I completely agree with you. I, I wrote an article on this for Only Sky somewhat recently. I was I was asked to actually by a humanist magazine who the editor was trying to get different opinions of woke, and he himself was fairly anti-woke and wanted me to present the other side. And my position is that it's just such an ill-defined term. It basically just is a modern iteration of the of the term libtard. Like it, it really, and it is it's that it's that. I guess, you know, that sounds simplistic and unnuanced, but that, that's how I see it. It's like anything that, as you say, anything that I don't like in my political positioning is therefore woke. And it's just really ill-defined. But another quote from her in her piece is this, which talks to both that and the idea that she's lacking this sense of meaning and purpose. So she says, in this nihilistic vacuum, the challenge before us becomes civilizational. We can't withstand China, Russia, and Iran if we can't explain to our populations why it matters that we do. We can't fight woke ideology if we can't defend the civilization that it is determined to destroy. As if, like, wokeism is going to destroy an entire civilization. This is like moral panic. Anyway, just to continue a little bit. And we can't counter Islamism with purely secular tools. To win the hearts and minds of Muslims here in the West, we have to offer them something more than the videos on TikTok. As if like philosophical secular humanism is just like trashy videos on TikTok. As if we can't take down the theological foundations of Islam with philosophical endeavor. I, I just, I'm really, it, uh, beggars belief. It's frustrating. Some of these yeah. Claims, yeah. I've just noticed that it seems to be the word they use whenever they encounter any sort of progressive idea, the idea of collectivist values, equality, advocacy. And I spoke earlier about uh, the Women's March in 2017, as we saw millions of people, women and men, actually supporting women who were uh, marching in protest after the Trump inauguration. And they legitimately feared that there was a war on women, on reproductive health. There was a sexist, misogynist predator who'd been elected to the most powerful chair in the United States. And so they rightfully and admirably went out and said, no, no, we will not be ignored. Ayan Hirsi Ali is like, ah, what a bunch of spoiled, rotten, privileged American women. They're all, you know, they just think that men want to keep them barefoot and pregnant. That was not the position being argued. That was not the statement being made. And I I found myself just shouting it at the screen when I read the article. It's like, what the hell, Ian? right? Yeah, and which is interesting because she has actually campaigned an awful lot for feminist ideals within the context particularly of Islam. And so, yeah, that's doubly frustrating in that respect. Someone, uh, uh, (laughs) it's a a very tongue-in-cheek comment at the end of my article, wrote, well then, she damn well needs to shut up and not be heard from again, the required role for a Christian woman. I mean, he obviously doesn't, doesn't mean that like, she should be quiet, but that's all uh, that. I do she- not permit a woman to teach. <laughs> Led, you're going to go second Timothy on Ian if she's exactly. going to become a Christian. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, you jump, oh, I don't know. It, it, but, but sometimes I think when people leave a religion, and admittedly there was a lo- there's been a long time since she left Islam to where she is now, but sometime when uh, I've got a very good friend who has ostensibly left Christianity, but he still has that hole in him that was filled by Christianity that he feels cannot be filled by atheism or secular humanism. So he's gone back to some kind of weird deism. But I see that that's similar thing in many people who come from this staunch kind of religiosity and then can't find the sorts of things that they were psychologically brought up with. And so they are searching possibly for the rest of their lives for that thing to fill that hole. And I think that's what's happened here. So there's, there's, in other words, there's a lot of psychology going on here and not an awful lot of rational thought. I had an awkward uh, time with my autobiography, Deconverted, dear friend, Teresa McBain left the Methodist church. She was a Methodist minister and realized she did not buy it. And and I asked her to write the foreword for Deconverted, and she was so kind to do so. And 
And, uh, you know, she went through a series of struggles. I think she had a hard time sort of finding her place mm. in the movement post-religion. And I am guessing here, I'm watching from my perch over, <laughs> over here outside her life, but I, I got the vibe that she missed the sense of belonging and security and community. All of a sudden... She says, no, I'm going back to the church. I was wrong. I now believe in God. But I couldn't shake the idea that she had remained adrift, and that drift spoke to her missing her tribe, missing the sense mm. of security and belonging. And when I was reading Ian's article, I thought, she's talking about how much she missed the feeling of being in a group that was consolidated and structured and even had power weaponized power against Islam. They are more tooled up than the atheists yeah. to fight the Islamic tide. Do you catch that? Well, yeah, there's almost a historical kind of reference in terms of like crusades and and, and such like. But I, I do, I'm really with you there. And there is this idea that atheism isn't a worldview per se, and it, trying to collectively appeal to atheists like herding cats it's so difficult because you have this whole gamut of different philosophical and political opinions within atheism because atheism does very little as a term. It's like, I, it's a proposition. I'm a strong atheist. So it's like, it's a proposition that I do not believe in God, but that's all it does. Like, I don't believe in God. So everything else I've got to work out for myself. And for someone that, you know, is used to having a lot of thought done for them. And for someone that is used to being in a social environment that supports them, a kind of familial social environment that, that churches or mosques provide, atheism doesn't do that. Now, I'm not saying that's definitely what's happened with Hersey Ellie, because I think she's been out of that you know, environment for a long time. For a lot of people, I think they generally struggle with that. And this is why movements like the Sunday Assembly and things like that do have a place. I think there is a need for bringing like-minded people together in social uh, environments that means that you have that supportive environment that can uh, help you get through your daily travails and hopefully do that in a secular way. Well, you know, she says, if we can't fight off these formidable forces, we'll call them forces of evil or whatever, unless we can answer the question, what is it that unites us? The response is that God is dead seems insufficient. It almost seems tactical. Now we can be a formidable force against our foes. But it, it, all this then talks to is the idea that God is merely functional. Again, it goes back to the not rationally justified as a position, but psychologically justified as a need. I need God in order to feel that I've got the right tools or to feel I've got something to, I guess, hide behind or be, be driven by or something. It's that psychological need. I mean, I, at the end of my article, I said, I can't help but think she's singularly failed to interact with the positive philosophy of secular humanism. She's missing all this in her kind of atheistic, I guess, lack of worldview just in her atheism that she, she wanted to find that or she thought she could only find that in Christianity. Well, actually, did you try really hard to find that within secular humanism? What, what was your interaction with humanism as a worldview? I mean, some people will class humanism as a religion. I know that's, that's debatable and controversial, but in kind of technical terms in the UK, for example, in terms of like education, religious education, what not, humanism can be seen as a religion. Well, how much have you interacted with that worldview? Talking here with columnist and philosopher, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. She got a couple extra minutes because I just want to keep spitballing here and talking about some stuff. That's right. In the article, I didn't wait for your answer either because I really don't care. I'm going to keep you anyway, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a to you. That's I am. I'm just using and abusing you. In the article, she said, atheism is too weak and divisive a doctrine to fortify us against our menacing foes. I'm a frontline atheist activist of a decade and a half. What doctrine of atheism is she talking about? This is the whole point. Like it, it, I mean, like we've been saying, it's not a doctrine. To make it a doctrine, you have to then pad it out with an awful lot of other philosophy. I mean, that's what secular humanism is. You know, you start with God doesn't exist. Okay, now what? And you construct a worldview from there on in, and that may or may not become a doctrine. 
But you can't, on the one hand, say that there is kind of no doctrine, it's an, it's nihilistic, and then say the doctrine's weak. I mean, she's playing around with these ideas of doctrine when really there isn't a doctrine at all. And when it comes to things like meaning and purpose, it's subjective. You have to make it for yourself and don't expect that to be thrust on you by a third party like God. And even if you believe in God, so I hate to break this to you, Hirsi Ali, but if you are going to Christianity expecting meaning and purpose, what you're wanting is some someone else, some third party entity, either the Christians around you or God, to thrust their own meaning and purpose on you you're still going to have to interpret that yourself. It's still a subjective process, but it's so much nobler to create your own meaning and purpose. She just gift-wrapped to the evangelicals their claim that atheism is just another religion. Yeah, I I mean, I think, uh, as you say, she's handed a lot of arguments to evangelicals on a plate here, saying exactly the sort of things they're going to be gleefully hearing. I mean, one has to say in certain, in certain lights, atheism is nihilistic because atheism doesn't tell you anything other than God doesn't exist, right? So if you think that's all atheism is, which is all it is, but, but it's there, therefore necessarily not everything else. You, again, you have to construct everything else. So you can interpret that as being nihilistic. There is nothing else there. Well, yeah, definitionally, there is nothing else there. But that doesn't mean that if you are an atheist, you have you know, you are nihilistic because you create all the, this other philosophy around it and you can live a wonderfully fulfilled life without God. You know, good without God is the badge that many humanists might pin to their lapel. You know, we can be good and we can have these really fulfilling, wonderful communities of, of non-believers who are brought together partly by their non-belief, but partly by shared understanding of how the universe works and how we can create really vibrant communities. All right, let's just, I don't know, let's just render an opinion. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just speaking subjectively. I feel like she got burned. She feels burned by liberals. And conservative culture is more Christian culture. I feel like part of this is a retreat into a safer place where she doesn't have to deal with analysis, commentary, criticism, even condemnation when she says dumb shit. I don't know. What do you think, John? I, I'd agree. And I, I think that here it's almost as if anti woke politics is more important. It drives her more than whether she believes in God or not. That is secondary. Whereas I wouldn't be placing these things against each other. They're just, I don't believe in God and I have these political beliefs. And those two aren't necessarily connected. But for her, as you've kind of intimated before, like the, she sees the only way to battle anti-woke ideology is to jump into a Christian worldview or a religious worldview. And you can understand that because it is the Christian nationalists in the US that are consistently banging on about this same idea that you see that so often every time you turn on Fox News, when Tucker Carlson was on there, it was all like anti-woke, anti-woke, blah, blah, blah. But together with that comes the, it's almost you know, one without the other is rare. Together comes this Christian worldview, this Christian nationalism as well. And it's all wrapped up with each other. And, and so that therefore, it doesn't surprise me that she, she, I think she made what is in the end a relatively small jump because really her move was a political one rather than a, a move from atheism to theism. Think any of this is going to really matter? I mean, on every blue moon or so, we'll see somebody who has been a frontline atheist or has been someone in the public eye, and I don't know, they do something odd or they're caught in a scandal or you know, something shit goes down, and everybody's like, "Aha!" But I, at the end of the day, I feel like that I'm not sure it's all that consequential. We're speaking about it because it is newsworthy, and yeah. I think people want to know, "Hey, what the hell happened?" and "What's your take?" But when the dust settles, does it really diminish us? I think because she was like a fringe new atheist mover and shaker, it's quite newsworthy. It's almost like a Hitchens on his deathbed goes, no, he didn't actually. Yeah, and yeah. But, but she mixed in that crowd a little bit. And so therefore, that's pretty newsworthy. But as you say, once in a blue moon tells you everything you need to know. Occasionally, this will happen. What you need to do is look at the data. So what does the data say about conversions versus deconversions? 
does it more happen more often happen that we have deconversions well i th- i think the data is pretty solid for that we are seeing a pretty continuous trend away from religious belief and also i think if it correct me if i'm wrong i don't even know but I think the data also supports that if you deconvert, you're more likely to stay deconverted than if you convert. So I think there's also a long-term commitment to atheism or non-belief that's more robust than the commitment to theism. But I may be incorrect on that. No, I think your data is correct. I'll have to look up the citation, but um, the ratios of apostates is that they stay apostates. It's not like people are leaving a religion and rushing back. In fact, if we see the trends of ex-religious people leaving church, the rising seculars or nuns, I think the data bears that out, Mm. and uh, I think it's striking. So, you know, you will find an outlier and Mm. a very public outlier, but I think the trend is actually in the reverse. People are like, this sucks. This is stupid. I don't buy it. It's damaging. I'm out. And they don't go back once they taste freedom. You know what I'm saying? There's probably an awful lot of other data as well that doesn't get announced. So when people convert to religion, and I am speculating here, but I guess people are quite open about that. It's like, oh, I found God again. Oh, brilliant. Right, I'm going to tell people about this. You get rather evangelical. But when people who are potentially quite famous or maybe people who are ensconced within uh, social and familial networks that are overtly religious, then there's going to be an awful lot of people that leave religion without telling anyone that they've left religion and keep it very personal to themselves. I mean, you will know this from deconversion accounts that people I'm sure have given you over time, that, that actually there's going to be an awful lot of data that doesn't reflect accurately the, um, the sheer number of people who are no longer believers. They're just not prepared to tell other people. Jonathan M.S. Pierce, thanks for an impromptu conversation. I just sort of ambushed you because I saw the article and I wanted to jump on this while the story was hot. Any final thoughts about Ayan Hirsi Ali, your article, the culture before we sign off? Yeah, it's just it's always interesting to look at the intersection of politics and religious belief or non-belief. And I think here we have another example of where I think the religious belief is probably piggybacking on the back of political belief. And it's that's really what's driving things here. And of course, the psychology of, you know, needs and desires and meaning and purpose and a, a lot of a lot of that, which has its links to religion. But I just think she was philosophically fairly naive in what she was claiming. I'll put your article as a link in the description box. Thanks for signing in and and uh, sounding off. Been great to talk to you again, brother. Appreciate it, mate. You know, I never want to fall into the no true Scotsman trap, right? Well, she wasn't a true atheist. That's not what I'm saying. I don't think that's what anybody's saying. We just wanted to analyze her quote unquote reasonings, given her history and try to figure out what the hell is going on. Anyway, interesting conversation. I've got a self-professed sweary historian joining me next week. If you haven't read the work of James Fell, buckle up. This guy's hysterical, and he's a hell of a storyteller with a new book called On This Day in History, Shit Went Down. Oh, yeah, we had to talk. He's next week. See you then. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and T-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website thethinkingatheist.com